We're talking to Dr. Michael Barber. He is at Sacred Heart University and he researches K through 12 online learning and all the configurations. I, Dr. Barber, I have two questions. My first is, what are trends that you're seeing in K-12 blended and online learning in the U.S.? Like, where are we and where might we be heading? Um, well, it's interesting that you say specifically in the U.S. because the U.S. environment is actually very different than any of the other environments when we're looking at online and blended learning, okay. uh, at least from a field perspective. Um, online and blended learning in the U.S. has really sort of been coupled together uh, whereas outside of the U.S., we tend to talk about online learning mainly at a distance. Blended learning oftentimes gets talked about as technology integration or some form of e-learning. Uh, and that e-learning goes on a spectrum from just basic technology integration to offering courses completely online um, within a, a, a local geographic context. Um, but within the U.S., we've seen those two terms really sort of intermingled, and I think that's largely due to many of the advocacy groups that have been pushing uh, in this field, organizations like INACOL and the um, Christensen Institute, even the Evergreen um, Education Group. And um, where we are right now, I mean, online learning as a means of delivery has been around for two and a half decades at this point. Uh, blended learning, depending on how you define it, uh, has probably been around just as long, although we've really only started calling it that in the past decade. Um, and again, that's largely due to those advocacy groups. Um, depending upon whose figures you look at, anywhere between about 5 to 6% of all K-12 students are learning in an online environment. Uh, that could be as high as up to 14 to 18% again depending upon whose statistics you're using there uh, so and it's a growing phenomenon it's it's growing considerably um sorry i didn't know if you were trying to jump in there oh no no that's huge. that's a big difference like five to 18 wow yeah and i mean but we do know that it is growing i mean if you look when the the first person that bothered to count this was Tom Clark back in, in 2000, 2001 as part of his State of the States report and he estimated at the time that there were between 40 and 50,000 students in the United States that were learning at a distance. Um, even the most conservative estimates right now say that that number is probably somewhere in the 1.5 to 2 million. Uh, range so you know we've seen a real exponential growth although that growth at least with the online component is starting to level off a fair amount um, part of that is due to regulatory environments um, you know we had a great explosion a great opening if you will at least that's the the language that a lot of these neoliberal advocacy groups would use an opening of markets for you know supplemental and in particular full-time programs that are often run by these for-profit cyber charters. Although that tends to be leveling off right now and what we've seen um, is a real growth in these hybrid or blended programs in the last few years. Um, one of the difficulties with all of this is that uh, when it comes to student performance in this kind of environment, uh, it's still not um, a good picture. Um, the research that we have in the supplemental environment tends to tell us that you know, our best and brightest students will continue to be our best and brightest students. Um, unfortunately, those students that are sort of the middle of the road students or more of our at-risk credit recovery type students, they struggle and struggle in high numbers in the supplemental environment. Uh, when it comes to the full-time environment, even though based upon the best data that we have, these full-time programs tend to over-enroll a higher class of student, a higher ability level of students. These online programs, these full-time online programs, tend to perform at much, much lower levels than what their brick-and-mortar counterparts do. And regardless if it's some of the more progressive organizations like the National Education Policy Center or more of the sort of educational reform-friendly neoliberal organizations like Credo out of Stanford University, um, you know, we've all, they've all found that, you know, full-time online programs actually perform quite poorly compared to their, their brick and mortar counterparts. And interestingly, um, it's actually sort of the first time we've looked at it because we've always sort of been under the impression that 
the blended model has tended to be a, a useful model for a lot of those struggling students and um, a way in which we could take the best of that sort of face-to-face -face brick and mortar instruction and meld it with the best aspects of the flexible kind of environment and that um, you know to use all of those neoliberal buzzwords that customized personalized individualized kind of you know competency-based environment in the online way um, but uh, the first time that's ever actually been looked at in a real systematic way was by Gary Murin as part of the annual virtual schooling report that the, the National Education Policy Center puts out. And he actually found that those blended programs perform at about the same level that those full-time online programs perform, which again is quite miserably compared to a traditional brick and mortar environment. Um, so the really, I think the, the biggest trend that I see within the U.S. is a growth in these programs, even though they haven't been producing the results that they claim they can. And the really the only people that are benefiting from it are these advocacy groups and the corporations that are backing them for the most part. Um, the number of the, you know, the percentage or proportion of students that are actually being served in good ways by these uh, programs are quite small and in many cases many of these students would have been served through other means within the educational system. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's interesting. What do you think is causing the miserable um, assessment, you know, date? I mean the assessment data that shows the sort of miserable results going on? Um, well, I think a lot of it has to do with how these programs are organized. Uh, for all of their talk about customization and personalization and individualization, it really is a one-size-fits-all model. You know, if you and I were both in a full-time online environment right now, we would both have a teacher that has a student-teacher ratio that's anywhere from two to maybe even five times the average student-teacher ratio in the classroom environment. Um, you and I would basically start off doing some kind of online assessment and based upon that online assessment the artificial intelligence that's built into the learning management system would figure out what we didn't know and give us you know in all honesty some well designed from an instructional design perspective uh, although very behavioralist okay. in terms of its, its structure I mean, it is very rote, not rote information. I mean, this is like an online thinking machine. Now it's a very fancy, glitzy, multimedia based, you know, with all the bells and whistles thinking machine, but it is an online thinking machine. Um, you know, so, you know, sort of the Skinnerian thinking machine. Right, sounds like in the ed tech kind of world. Um, you know, but if you got say 30% of that quit, that assessment wrong, and I got 40% wrong, but 20% of what we got wrong was consistent with each other we would actually get the exact same instruction. The only personalization that actually happens is how much of the instruction you and I do. If we have the same things wrong, we get the exact same instruction. And then we go and do another assessment, and you know, if we get 80% on that assessment, which is what they perceive or what they use as a guide for mastery, then we move on to the next bit. If we don't get 80%, we get another set of content, again, about that stuff that we didn't know. The teachers are basically only there to be on-demand tutors, or if we fail to log in for a period of time, they're required to actually come, you know, and try to cajole us into participating, which is why they're able to have such a high student-teacher ratio, because these folks aren't really teachers. You know, I mean, they are sort of tutors in that old correspondence distance ed model that we used to send off the packet and the tutor would grade it. Well, now the tutor doesn't grade stuff. The computer does all that for them. They're just there to answer questions and to basically be like a truant officer. Um, you know, so that's one of the, the difficulties, I think, is just this, it is a one-size-fits-all model, both in terms of the way in which the curriculum is put together, the structure that's put in place to support students, and the way students are instructed uh, within that model. Mm -hmm. And that is really done because most of these blended and not full-time online programs are being run by for-profit corporations. Mm -hmm. You know, and anyone who's familiar with sort of a business cycle, you know, the more widgets you can put through based upon a, you know, a particular dollar figure, the more profitable you are. Well, within the full-time and blended online, um, you know, within the online and full-time online and blended schooling environment, the students are the widgets. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so the more that they can pull through with a single teacher, with a single set of curriculum, with a single support kind of structure, that okay. is very profitable to them. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, like K-12 Inc., which is the largest of these companies, it's a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. You can sort of look them up on the ticker. Their stock number is LRN. Um, yeah, and um, you know their CEO. They have about 170,000 students, which makes them you know, a big school district. You know, I mean, we're talking, you know, New York City, LA Unified, you know, that kind of size. You know, but their CEO makes you know several millions of dollars. Most of their board members are all making one plus million dollars, and that's just based salary. That doesn't count bonuses in many cases. How many superintendents do you know across the country that are making you know million plus dollars on an annual basis? plus having bonuses and stock options and wow, all sorts of other things. Wow. Um, you know, so I mean, that's that's really what's sort of driving a lot of this. Um, it's one of the reasons why you see that um, one of the things that the research does show is size of program actually makes a big difference when we're looking at student performance. The smaller the program, um, the better they tend to perform. And one of the reasons for that is, is it's a scale thing. You know, if you're looking at a focused group of students and you're trying to address the needs of a specific type of student and you're only interested in that kind of student, uh, you can really tailor a program around that. Uh, one of the best examples I always use is there's a, a program up in Port Huron, Michigan called um, it's, it's run by the St. Clair County Regional Educational Services Agency, or their RISA there. It's called the Virtual Learning Academy. And they work with students that have been involved in the juvenile justice system. So all of their students are folks that either have been in juvenile detention, some of them in jail, or are just getting out of that kind of environment. Many of these students have been permanently expelled or permanently excluded from the traditional brick and mortar system. Mm-hmm because they're targeting just this group of students they can look at it and say okay for this particular population of students how can we design a program that is going to cater to their needs you know so one of the things that they do is students only take two classes at a given time to decrease the number of subjects that they've got to focus upon you know so now they'll still complete six or eight or ten courses throughout the course of a year but they're only doing two at any given time. And if they finish, you know, um, they're say they started off doing like a science and a math course. And on the 3rd of November, they finished the science course. They would then get enrolled into say a social studies course. And then maybe on the 2nd of December, they finished the math course and then they get enrolled into an English course. So they're only having to focus upon two subject areas at any given time. Um, the, they have a structure set up where the school is actually open a much longer than what a traditional school would be. Um, I, the, the hours I know when they first started, I don't know what they exactly are now, but it was oftentimes, you know, an eight to eight, Monday to Thursday, eight to four on Fridays and Saturdays. There was always a couple of teachers that were in the building available for students to um, interact with. The students all had their teacher cell phone numbers. Um, Teachers were assigned students in sort of a homeroom kind of concept. So while the students were taking the courses in an online format, they had a homeroom teacher, if you will, that they were responsible for checking in with. And they were actually required to come to the building for eight hours a week in two separate cities. You know, but they basically looked at this particular population and said, how can we design a a flexible kind of program that's going to meet their needs not this one size fits all model that uh, you know a lot of these cyber charters are using where they're catering to you know that high level athlete that can't go to a brick and mortar school because they're traveling for competition um, or that student that already has some kind of career as well as the student who was bullied in school and really just doesn't want to go to a brick and mortar environment because of that or the student that has failed most of their courses three and four times and are now trying something as an alternative. You can't have one program that caters to those five or six different types of students. Right. That sounds ideal. Like truly, per- like it makes you wonder what personalized learning means. It depends on who you ask. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, the thing I like about a lot of these smaller programs is, you know, I mean, what they're doing is they're saying we have a certain segment of our students that aren't being served 
in our traditional brick and mortar kind of environment. How can we think creatively using some of these online tools, in some cases in completely online ways, in some cases in hybrid and blended ways, to really cater to their needs so that we can actually provide them with an education like we are legally required to do. Right. That's all interesting. I want to explore. I want to learn more. I know you're an expert at this. Um, has anybody done research talking to students with learning disabilities and how they're doing or not doing well in these programs? Um, kind of. There is a federally funded center for, it's actually called the Center for Online Learning Students with Disabilities, oh. uh, based at the University of Kansas. Um, one of the, I will be perfectly frank and say this, that one of the unfortunate things about it was uh, when it was awarded um, by the Federal Department of Education, there were very few folks that were actually involved in the field of online learning that were part of the initiative. Uh, the vast majority of folks that were part of it were special education folks. Uh, because of that, much of the work that they've done for the first three or four years, and it's only a five-year uh, project, or at least it's only funded for five years, mm -hmm. uh, but much of the work that they've done has tended to be descriptive and exploratory, oftentimes learning things that those of us that have been in the field um, already could have told them in a 15-minute right. conversation. Um, so unfortunately, while there is this center that's available, um, they have been doing some work and, and some of their more recent work is I think starting to get at some of the, the real issues that need to be tackled in that particular area um, but for the most part much of what they've published to date uh, have been things that you could have read from Kathy Kavanaugh or Margaret Roblier or Tom Clark or Elizabeth Murphy or some of those earlier folks in the field even before I first got in, involved with K-12 online work. Gotcha. So there's a need. Okay. That's good to know. Um, well, thank you. And then my second question is a little different. Um, just, I guess, just mainly focusing on more like non-corporate, but public school, maybe just thinking about, because most of our students nearly all go into public schools. Um, and most of ours just stay in the area, Dallas, Fort Worth. And so increasingly I'm seeing blended learning is more so in secondary, but also in, you know, elementary. Um, what do we need to be doing to prepare pre-service teachers to kind of hit the ground running, like in your opinion? Well, it's, it's actually interesting because there's actually been work that's been done in this area now for almost a decade. Um, Nikki Davis, when she was still with Iowa State University, had a, a federally funded FIPSI grant um, that uh, actually was entitled Teacher Education Goes Into Virtual Schooling. And one of the things that um, sort of in a conceptual or framework way, uh, that she, she sort of, uh, how she structured her particular program was she looked at the idea of, you know, at the time it was just a virtual school teacher, but it applies to both online and blended teachers, regardless if you're in that more corporate model or even in the public school system, it's, it's applicable across the field, I think. Um, but essentially the role of the teacher becomes diffused. Mm. In, in a traditional brick and mortar classroom, um, I decide, you know, what we're going to learn tomorrow. Now, I've got some, you know, objectives and stuff I've got to cover based on, you know, the Common Core and state standards and, you know, oftentimes whatever textbook the school district has decided to buy into or whatever resources they've bought into. But in terms of the actual what happens in the classroom, I'm responsible for designing that on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm responsible for delivering that on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I'm responsible for supporting or facilitating the students on a day-to-day -day basis. When you look at an online or blended kind of model, those three roles really are done oftentimes by three different people. You know, there is oftentimes a specific individual or even a team of individuals that are responsible for designing the asynchronous course content that we use in an online course or in a blended course. You know, oftentimes teachers just get this stuff. We don't actually create this stuff. You know, there's somebody that actually delivers the instruction either in the room in a blended format or if it's an online course, you know, there is an online teacher. Mm -hmm. 
And then really, and this, the third one is, I think, where most of our teachers need to be, uh, have some facility with because it's the one that they're most likely to do. You know, for those teachers that have online students at their school that they're not actually teaching, but, you know, they're being taught by some online teacher or somewhere else in the world or somewhere else in the state, but the kids are still, you know, at my school. Um, or I've got kids that are taking stuff in a blended fashion. I still need to be able to facilitate and to support right. what's going on. I mean, those kids, you know, that we put in the online class, they just don't go into a computer lab by themselves and just sort of expect to learn. Right. You know, we need to have some sort of school-based kind of support. Oftentimes it's called a mediating teacher or mentor teacher. Some places it's called a virtual school facilitator. You know, but each of those three roles requires, you know, different skill sets. And, you know, I think for both our pre-service and our in-service teachers, um, I think we should give them a, a little bit of both, but a lot on the third. Mm -hmm. You know, I think our, our, our pre-service and in-service uh, teachers that we're working with, I think they should know how not just to um, evaluate and curate online content, but I think they should have some senses how to create online content on their own. Because while there's a lot of good resources out there, yeah. you know, there's oftentimes something about it that just doesn't you know address everything that you need and and if they could only do one other thing with this these three things i found it would be perfect you know so we need to be able to give our teachers the skills to be able to design that little bit that's missing so when they curate the other things it's sort of a complete package for them. Um, we do need to teach our, our, our in-service and pre-service teachers how to teach online or teach in a blended format. Um, you know, not all of them teach in this way, but many of them will. And it gives them an opportunity to decide, you know, if that's something they're interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, Central Florida University for a long time has actually allowed their students to, um, actually it's almost been a decade now, uh, where they've allowed their students to actually do an online student teaching with the Florida Virtual School. It's a partnership they've developed. And um, one of the interesting things, they survey all of the, the teachers, or the pre-service teachers, pre-service teacher candidates, I guess, um, at the end of their student teaching experience. And for those that have done an online experience, one of the things they ask them is, ask them is, you know, as you know, as you know, um, you know, having taught, you know, student taught online, is this something that you might think, you know, you'd like to do for your career? And it's interesting because invariably, um, about a third of them say, yes, if I had the opportunity, this is the only way I would teach and I would be happy to do this for the rest of my career. Wow. About a third of them say, you know, well, yeah, you know, I could see myself doing this, but I also enjoyed my face-to-face -face student teaching. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go wherever I can get a job kind of model. And about a third of them said, no, I would never teach online. You couldn't pay me enough to teach online, um, which is interesting because, you know, it gives those, it, it gives our, our, our teacher education candidates, you know, a really sort of good, uh, you know, metacognitive awareness of, you know, both the strengths and the weaknesses of, you know, and the differences uh, uh, you know, between teaching in an online environment and teaching in a face-to-face -face environment and allows them to sort of get a sense as to, you know, is this something that I might like to do? Yeah, you never um, you know. know. Yeah. Mm. And then the third thing that I think, and this is really where we need to focus, I think, our attentions for, you know, preparing people to be able to, to deal with the online and blended environment is that facilitator role that mentor role right. um, you know there's a lot of good work being done in this area you know the initial work that nikki davis did is part of that teacher education goes into virtual schooling initiative um, you know there's a group up in newfoundland uh, dennis mulke he being one of them that has been at memorial university of newfoundland that have been looking at they use the term mediating teacher there um, there's a, a, no, a a fair amount of research coming out of New Zealand looking at the role of the ED, which is the term that they use for that school-based mentor. And most recent, or actually, sorry, um, UNC Chapel Hill had a um, IES grant as part of their uh, National Research Center for Rural Education Support. It's like, um, um, I can't remember her first name now, but her last name is Delavere. Matt Irving and Wally Hammond were part of that initiative. 
um, but they were looking again at that role of the virtual school facilitator. And then most recently, um, Jared Borup and the work that he's been doing with initially with his dissertation and Mountain Heights Academy in Utah, but uh, more recently with uh, the Michigan Virtual Learning, uh, Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute. Mm -hmm. um, they've been doing a fair amount of work looking at, and they use the term virtual school mentor um, yeah. in Michigan. Uh, but, you know, so there's a lot of resources that have been built from these various initiatives. Uh, when you're looking at sort of those three roles of the teacher, it's probably the one that's got the most research available, which for us is, is a great thing because, you know, one of the difficulties for a lot of what we do with K-12 online and blended learning and teacher education is we don't have that much research to guide a lot of the things that we're trying to put together. You know, that idea of how do we prepare our pre-service and in-service teachers to, uh, you know, be able to have, perform that facilitator or that support role, that's one area where we actually have a bit of research that can help guide what we do with, you know, essentially the, the, the skills and knowledge and abilities that we provide our, um, you know, candidates. With. Mm -hmm. I love the mentoring focus. I've been doing some digital mentoring research, action research on my own teaching on using synchronous learning, webinar based kind of learning. Through, um, and so that's been a real interest. And we've used, we've drawn on literature like from Murphy and colleagues the coaching, mentoring, and facilitating kind of roles, and those really make sense to me. Okay. And so that's really been helpful. That all resonates with me. That's great. Um, I like the mentoring aspect that you mentioned. Did you? Yeah, and like I said, it's, it's the one that our teachers are most likely to perform, so it's the one we should probably spend the most time getting them ready for. That's good. I like that. And then I think, too, just being flexible, like the tech support that you might have to give to students and you may not know answers so knowing how to look that up is also a skill I just <laughs> there's there's actually I think great benefit to you know sitting there with a student and muddling your way through something because oh, you know you're sort of verbalizing and and going through that critical thinking problem solving process of how do I you know deal with whatever technical issue that I've come up with and you know, the students, if they're, you know, if you use that as a teaching moment, I think are quite, you know, helpful, you know, in much the same way that in theory, the virtual school mentor, or the facilitator isn't supposed to be a source of content based support. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be an English teacher and you might have a bunch of students in the back of your room doing credit recovery algebra one. Mm -hmm. um, again, that idea of muddling through trying to figure out the answer to an Algebra 1 problem when it may be a decade or 15 years ago since the last math class you took. Right. You know, that sort of working it through and trying to figure it out and, you know, where you go looking to try to get the answers and the help and how do I do this next step. Mm -hmm. Again, all of that is, I think, part of how we go about supporting our students. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so those are actually just some of the skills that if you look at some of the research by, you know, the North Carolina uh, Chapel Hill folks or that Jared has been doing or that, you know, Dennis Mulcahy here and Nikki Davis has been doing, that's actually one of the things that they will talk about. That idea of sort of, you know, they don't use the term muddling through, but I mean, that's really what we're talking about. Yeah, I call it troubleshooting, but yeah, muddling through, that's a skill. Yeah, it, it takes time. Um, well, thank you. I think you've um, brought up a lot of good points and given some food for thought. Do you have anything else you want to mention? No, I think that's about it. Okay, great.